Zoom meeting. Hi, all. We will begin shortly. Thank you for your patience.
That is correct. Yes. Testing one, two, three. Can you hear me? This is Vanessa at Cable TV. Good. Um, can we have somebody count to uh, 20 for us, please, for audio check? Thank you. We can hear you, Vanessa. Can you hear us? Perfect. I can hear you. Yes, wonderfully. Great. Thank you, Brooke. Okay. One moment.
testing for sound. Can you hear me okay? Testing for sound. I'm very sorry to everybody waiting patiently. We're trying to get this tech issue resolved. We should hopefully be with you all shortly. Testing. Testing, one, two, three. How about that, Mari? How about that, Mari? They're trying to see you. There we go. There we go. All right. Okay. So you got her, right? So we can start. Hey, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for your patience and sorry for this delay. I would like to call to order this public roundtable of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. It is now 9.44 a.m. on Thursday, January 19th, 2023. We are conducting the roundtable virtually and streaming on Council Channel 13, the DC Council's website, and our YouTube channel, which can be found at CM Brooke Pinto. I am Council Member Brooke Pinto, representing Ward 2 and the Chairwoman of the Committee. The purpose of today's roundtable is to discuss five nominees to serve on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. They are PR 25-34, the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, Lisa Geller Confirmation Resolution of 2022, PR 25-35, the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, Layla Lee Confirmation Resolution of 2022, PR 25-36, the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, Shannarese Sims Confirmation Resolution of 2022, PR 25-37, the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, Verino Winder Confirmation Resolution of 2022, and PR 25-37, 38, the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, Ashley Joyner Chavros confirmation resolution of 2022. The Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, which is under the Office of Victim Services and Justice Grants, is responsible for tracking domestic violence related deaths, assessing the circumstances surrounding those deaths and any associated risk indicators, and making recommendations to improve the systemic response to victims of domestic violence. Their work is critical to our efforts to prevent intimate partner and other domestic violence homicides in the district. 
An estimated 39% of women in the district have been physically or sexually assaulted by an intimate partner in their lifetime. This is staggering. During the pandemic lockdown, reports of domestic violence rose even higher. I look forward to working closely with the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, including the five nominees before us today, to reverse the rising rate of domestic violence in the district and ensure survivors have the support services they need to recover. This is also my first roundtable as the chairwoman of the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety, and us doing this at the outset is a testament to how seriously we take this issue and how important we know it is to ensure that experts are taking on this work at the board. I am focused on this issue of domestic violence and ways in which we can support victims through our broader work on this committee and the council as we work to lift up women and girls. I will now briefly introduce the five nominees who will be testifying today. Lisa Geller is the Director of State Affairs at the John Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. She previously served as the State Affairs Manager at the Educational Fund to Stop Gun Violence and the Coalition to Stop Gun Violence, where her work focuses on research, advocacy, and implementation of evidence-based gun violence prevention policies. Ms. Geller is especially interested in the intersection of firearms and domestic violence. She helps manage disarmdv.org, a website that compares laws between states, presents statistics about gun violence and firearms, and provides information on the statutory process of firearm removal in cases of domestic violence protective orders. Layla Lee currently serves as the supervising attorney and qualified tax expert at Columbus Community Legal Services the in-house firm and clinical legal program at the Catholic University of America Columbus School of Law. Ms. Lee previously managed the policy and legal services program at Break the Cycle, now part of Network for Victim Recovery DC, which is a national nonprofit organization serving youth who experience dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking. Shannery Sims is a licensed graduate professional counselor and specializes in issues stemming from interpersonal violence, sexual abuse, trauma, and anxiety. She works as a program manager at Network for Victim Recovery of DC, managing therapeutic services for survivors of intimate partner violence and sexual assault. Verena Winder is a senior policy advisor and foreign affairs officer in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State. In this role, Ms. Winder advises on gender-based violence, women's and girls' health, and sustainable development goals. Previously, she was on detail in Deputy Secretary Hingenbottom's office, working on development, global health, and gender issues. She has also worked at the U.S. Embassy in Bogota, Colombia, where she served as a political officer covering human rights and gender on the Bureau of Population, Refugees, and Migration's Gender and Youth Team. She joined the department as a presidential management fellow, leading Latin American policy development and engagement for the Global Women's Issues Office. And Ashley Joyner Chavros serves as a special counsel at Covington and Burling LLP and is a junior board member of the District of Columbia Volunteer Lawyers Project. Ms. Chavros also maintains an active pro bono practice specifically concerning special education advocacy and child custody neglect litigation. Through the DC Lawyers Project, she advocates for better policies and legislation and increased funding for domestic violence victims and at-risk children. Ms. Chavros also represents victims in obtaining protective orders, ordering their abusers to stay away, and provides legal advice, housing assistance, and counseling at weekly resource clinics. The committee hopes to hear from the nominees today about their visions for the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board, how their professional experience will inform their participation on these bodies, and other information essential to determining whether to move the nominations forward. I would like to turn to my colleague, if she's still with us, Councilmember at Large Anita Bonds, may have left us, but thank you for joining us earlier. Um, so I will now call our five nominees, Lisa Geller, Layla Lee, Shannery Sims, Rena Winder, and Ashley Joyner-Chavros. 
It is the tradition of this committee to swear in all government witnesses who appear before us. So if you could please repeat after me, we can do this all at once. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of law that the testimony you are about to provide under penalty of law the testimony you are about to provide before the Council of the District of Columbia before the Council of the District of Columbia and this committee is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. And this committee is the truth, the whole truth. Yes, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. So I would now like to invite our nominees to give any testimony or remarks you may have. And due to time, we are going to start with Brina with her. Great, thank you, uh, Chairperson Pinto, members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. Thank you to Mary Bowser for uh, nominating me to continue serving as a community representative on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board or DVFRB. I'd also like to thank the committee for inviting me to testify before you today. And I do want to acknowledge that I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the incredible work of Kate Bocamp, the current coordinator of the DVFRB, as well as that of Rebecca Drake, who previously served in this position. Um, both of these women have been incredible leaders, professionalizing the board, ensuring greater confidentiality, including through COVID, setting important norms, and inviting inclusive participation each and every time we meet. I believe the district is stronger for their leadership and commitment, especially on this particular and very challenging issue, and have appreciated enormously the support for a dedicated coordinator role. As the chairperson mentioned, my name is Verena Winder. I'm a Ward 6 resident. I was born here in the district, and while I have spent the majority of my childhood elsewhere, I've been a proud DC resident since I returned for college. Over the past 20 years, DC is my, has become my true home. Like me, both of my children were born here, my daughter even in the same hospital as I was. And I've sought ways to serve this home that we all share. I've had the honor of serving on the DVFRB as a community representative since June of 2014. And as I noted in my original application package almost 10 years ago, I felt called to participate on the board because the work of preventing and responding to all forms of gender-based violence is a deeply held professional and personal value. During my time on the board, I have served solely as a community representative, which means my participation on this board is not based on any specific information I may bring about the victims whose cases we review. Unlike some of my fellow board members, I've likely never met the victims or provided response services, nor will I represent them or their families in court. My connection to them is simply as a neighbor and as a fellow resident of this city. In my day job, um, you read the bio, it's a, a little out of date, but I'm, I serve as the deputy senior official in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the US Department of State. We work on elevating and advancing gender equality all around the world. And one of the most systemic barriers to women's and girls' full participation in public, economic, and private life is this pervasive, traumatic persistence of gender-based violence. More than one in three women will face physical or sexual abuse during her lifetime usually at the hands of an intimate partner. And unfortunately, this global statistic holds true in the United States, as well as in the district, as Chairperson mentioned at the top. Here, according to our latest report, 39% of women have experienced such assault. Over the past nine years that I've served on the board, we've reviewed dozens of cases of fatalities, usually, but not always women, who died, usually, but not always, at the hands of their current or former intimate partner. As a board, we've interviewed surviving family members to understand more about their loved ones' lives and to understand where we, as service providers, government agencies, and importantly, as neighbors, could better support these individuals. We've made recommendations to the city about integrating additional violence awareness in schools, improving, uh, improving the service referral process for individuals interacting with the justice system, developing awareness campaigns of existing tools to address domestic violence, including our so-called red flag law. We have also restarted 
an annual report process that underscores the trends in the district regarding domestic violence, including IPV, work that has become even more vital during the young years of the COVID pandemic and its related uptick in violence. Gender-based violence is a serious human rights violation with long-lasting effects not only for the person who experiences it, but for their families, their communities, and for wider society. All individuals, no matter who they are, where they live, deserve to live lives free from the threat of violence. And should it occur, each and every resident of our city deserves a timely, compassionate, evidence-based response. As part of this board, should I be reconfirmed, I pledge to, to continue my part in supporting this vital work. Thank you for the honor of allowing me to testify, and more importantly, for providing a platform to highlight the important work of this board. Thank you very much, Ms. Winder. Next, we're gonna to turn to Lisa Geller for any opening remarks or testimony you have to deliver. Thank you. Morning, um, Chairperson Pinto and members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. I want to also start by thanking Mayor Bowser for nominating me to continue to serve as a member of the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board and thank the committee for inviting me to come and testify today. As, um, as Chairperson Pinto mentioned, my name is Lisa Geller. I am a Ward 3 resident and DC native. I attended school in the district from kindergarten through 12th grade and have lived in the city since finishing college and graduate school. In my professional role, I'm the Director of State Affairs at the Johns Hopkins Center for Gun Violence Solutions at the School of Public Health. In this role, I study policies to reduce gun violence and use research to promote evidence-based policies at the state level. My area of expertise is the intersection of domestic violence and gun violence. In 2021, I published research exploring the connection between domestic violence and mass shootings, in which we found that nearly 70% of mass shootings in the US are connected to domestic violence. In addition, I work with state legislators and advocates to advance policies to reduce gun violence and domestic violence. I believe that we can mitigate this crisis by using a public health approach to prevent homicides instead of being reactionary. In the year since I've served on the board, I've learned a great deal about domestic violence homicides in the district and have gotten to know the state actors responsible for and interested in preventing them. As one of the only researchers and policy experts on the board, I see it as my role to help bring research and advocacy um, to solving this public health crisis. I will continue to bring this experience and expertise to the board if confirmed for a new term. So to close, I wanna reiterate my appreciation to Chairperson Pinto and members of the committee for inviting me to testify today. I look forward to continuing to work to keep everyone in the district safe from domestic violence. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Geller. Next, we will turn to Ashley Joyner Travers. Thank you, and good morning, Chairperson Pinto and members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. I too would like to thank Mayor Bowser for nominating me to continue serving as a member on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. I would also like to thank the committee for allowing me to appear and testify before you all today. As noted, my name is Ashley Joyner Chavis, and I'm a resident of the Pin Branch neighborhood in Ward 7. A native of Atlanta, Georgia, I moved to the District of Columbia in 2009 to attend Howard University School of Law, following a career as a newspaper reporter covering crime in the courts at daily newspapers in New York City, the St. Louis metropolitan area, and Macon, Georgia. At Howard Law, I inherited the credo of esteemed former Dean and civil rights practitioner, Charles Hamilton Houston, who said, a lawyer is either a social engineer or a parasite on society. One who understands the constitution of the United States and knows how to explore its uses in solving the problems of local communities and in bettering conditions of the underprivileged citizens. I practice white collar law in the, white, in the Washington office of Covington and Burling, an international law firm. My practice focuses on high stakes criminal and civil enforcement matters, inter internal corporate investigations and congressional investigations. I also routinely handle highly sensitive reviews and investigations related to workplace misconduct and institutional culture and assessments of corporate practices involving civil rights and equity issues. Perhaps more relevant to my work as a community member on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board over the last several years, at Covington, I maintain an active pro bono practice with a particular focus on civil rights matters, 
child custody and neglect litigation and other family law matters, including representation of women and children survivors of domestic violence and protection order proceedings. I have served as a community member of this board and now co-chair because I firmly believe that we must improve systems in the District of Columbia that serve domestic violence victims and survivors to prevent domestic violence deaths. Through detailed fat fatality reviews on a monthly basis, our board evaluates risk factors for the victim and the offender prior to the homicide in an individual case. Any apparent gaps in services relevant to the individuals and circumstances involved, system failures or weaknesses associated with the death, and recommendations for policy or systems improvement, including prevention strategies. The board concludes review of cases by making recommendations to specific agencies to strengthen systemic responses in the District of Columbia in an effort to prevent future domestic violence homicides. Additionally, we analyze broader trends and patterns in domestic violence homicides and systemic responses and evaluate our broader recommendations in each reporting year and over time to incorporate top line recommendations for systemic improvements, prevention and education programs, and training to address domestic violence homicides. It has been my honor to serve on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board and now to lead our board members' remarkable work alongside Ms. Lee and our coordinator, Kate Bocamp. If reconfirmed, I look forward to continuing my leadership of the board and our collective efforts to enhance coordination among individuals, agencies, and the community as a whole and improve the safety and welfare of residents of the District of Columbia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shabas. Next, we will turn to Layla Lee. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Pinto, members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. First, also allow me to thank Mayor Bowser for nominating me to continue serving as a member on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. I would also like to thank the committee for allowing me to come and testify before you today. As noted, my name is Layla Lee. I'm a resident of Ward 3. I have lived in the District of Columbia since 2005, previously residing in Wards 1 and 6. I came from the Chicago area originally, where when in college in 2002, I took a 40-hour training to work as a domestic violence crisis line operator. While I had originally pursued a career in international conflict resolution or foreign service, I realized many more intimate conflicts at home needed the support from dedicated professionals. Years later, in 2009 or 10, while in law school, I met CUA families and the law clinical professor, Lisa Martin, who served on the DVFRB for many years. Professor Martin suggested I write a DVFRB case summary and provide a case overview at the meeting to fulfill my clinical community service requirement. I then first understood the significance of the DVFRB's work. If we could not restore their lives, then at least we must give victims of domestic violence dignity and respect in their deaths. We must learn something to prevent similar tragedies. Of course, in late 2015, when a colleague suggested nominating me to the DVFRB, I welcomed the honor. In 2016, when I joined the DVFRB, I brought more than a decade of experience providing direct services as an advocate and then as an attorney to survivors of dating and domestic violence. I worked as an advocate for several years and in several roles through Survivors and Advocates for Empowerment, both in their court-based advocacy and on-call advocacy programs. From 2009 forward, I provided direct legal services to domestic violence and dating violence survivors in civil protection order, child custody, divorce, immigration, and related matters in several capacities at Catholic University's legal clinical program, through Break the Cycle, and at Maryland Legal Aid. Each of these organizations took a holistic approach to legal representation and examined systemic factors that may hinder domestic violence survivors' ability to attain safety and independence. And I internalized that approach. Moreover, I provided training, technical assistance, and policy expertise to countless professionals. It's been a privilege over the last six years to use this experience to serve on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. As a community representative of the board since 2016, I've served in my individual capacity and of my own volition. We've reviewed some very difficult cases, but with encouraging results. Most target agencies that receive DVFRB's recommendations to strengthen responses, provide training or develop prevention and education programs, 
accepted those recommendations as written or with modifications. As of 2022, I've served as co-chair of the DVFRB with the wonderful Ashley Joyner Chavis, redoubling my commitment to the DVFRB. We've worked hard in the last year with the incredibly dedicated and detailed board coordinator, Kate Bokheim, to, prov to promote engagement and expertise sharing from all members. Most recently, we recorded an orientation video for new members to welcome them to the board and to give an overview of their responsibilities. We know we need everyone's participation and preparation to arrive at the best possible recommendations. If confirmed for another term, I most want to continue examining methods to strengthen supports for child survivors of domestic violence homicides in the district addressing the and addressing the prevalence of firearms and domestic violence fatalities. Uh, the honorable, to the Honorable Chairperson Pinto and to all members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety, I appreciate again the opportunity to address you today and to provide testimony in support of my continued nomination to the District of Columbia Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. I welcome any questions that you may have. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Ms. Lee. And next, we have Shannery Sims. Thank you. Good morning, Chairperson Pinto and members of the Committee on the Judiciary and Public Safety. I want to also thank Mayor Bowser for nominating me to continue serving as a member on the Domestic Violence Vitality Review Board. I would also like to thank the committee for allowing me to come and testify before you all today. My name is Shannery Sounds, and I am a Ward 6 resident. My entrance into anti-violence work began 11 years, ago, 11 years ago when I was a sophomore at The Ohio State University. I witnessed violence in my childhood and wanted to understand why this type of trauma seems to impact so many people. This curiosity about the inner workings of violence led me to join a campus organization called It's Abuse. I became president of that organization and our education and prevention efforts resulted in coordinating a campus-wide women's summit on relationship abuse. It was an enormous event and set the precedent for my career path. Consequently, I moved to DC and have worked in various victim service organizations for the past decade. In 2022, I was provided an opportunity to sit on the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board. And once I read the FRB's, um, FRB's 2021 annual report, I learned about its citywide collaborative efforts to assess risk and improve the systemic response to victims of domestic violence. I knew it was an opportunity to effect change as a community member. Due to my background and professional experience in Washington, D.C., I'm well-versed in resources available to the community. My work has introduced me to a network of victim service providers in the city, as I often collaborated with agencies to find the best possible resources for survivors of domestic violence. Operating from a trauma-informed care lens, I have also supported survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, substance users, and neurodivergent clients overcome barriers to receive services. I stand firm in the concept of community care, and it is what fuels me as a current program manager for an organization serving survivors of crime, Network for Victim Recovery of DC. If confirmed, I look forward to attending DVFRB's meetings, making sure I'm well prepared to contribute to the board's work and helping make progress toward the board's future goals. I remain steadfast in my commitment to eradicate violence against women through advocacy, education, and trauma-informed support services. And it is this commitment I hope to bring to a new commission term. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Sims. Thank you to all of our nominees. So I'm gonna ask you all a, a few foundational qualification questions. And if you could just say yes or no, and you can all kind of speak at once after each question. So first, are you a resident of the District of Columbia? Yes. yes. And if so, which ward do you preside? Ward 7. Ward 6. Ward 3. Are you currently an officer or director of any corporation, partnership, or other organization in the District of Columbia, either for profit or nonprofit, which is doing business with the District of Columbia government? No. Do you or does any member of your immediate family hold an ownership interest in any firm that is now doing or has ever done business with the District of Columbia government? No. No. Are you currently a member of any board or commission connected with the District of Columbia government? No. Uh, aside from the DVFRB, no. no. None other than the present board. Thank you. 
Do you have any outstanding liability for any taxes, fees, or other payments to the district, federal, or other state or local governments, either contested or uncontested? No. Yeah. Have you ever been investigated, disciplined, or cited for a breach of ethics for unprofessional conduct by or been the subject of a complaint to any court, administrative agency, professional association, disciplinary committee, or other professional group? No. To your knowledge, have you ever been investigated, arrested, charged, or convicted, including pleas of guilty or nolo contendere by any federal, state, or other law enforcement authority for violation of any federal, state, county, or municipal law other than a minor traffic offense? No. And lastly, have you or any business of which you are or were an officer, director, or owner ever been involved as a party in interest in any administrative agency proceeding or civil litigation? No. No. Okay. Thank you very much. So I want to start with Ms. Chavos. How does your work experience and background um, help you contribute to the Domestic Violence Fatality Review Board's mission? Thank you for the question. Um, my background, both as a, a newspaper reporter, as a journalist, an investigative journalist, and now as a practicing lawyer, I've practiced for going on 11 years on, in DC at Covington and at a predecessor firm. Um, certainly enables my work on the board. Um, as I described earlier, um, the bulk of our kind of day-to-day -day work, and really that's month-to-month -month work, are the case reviews that we carry out um, in a collaborative fashion that requires our review and study assessment synthesis of often voluminous records in advance of collaborative discussions during our meeting time, during which we extract themes, um, observations, prepare timelines, and go about fact-finding and analysis in a way that really resembles the work that I do as a lawyer and the work that I did as a journalist. And so those, those skills, and those fact-finding skills, certainly um, are skills that I draw on in our in our day-to-day -day work. Additionally, as, as a senior lawyer at at Covington, um, I'm often leading meetings of teams and guiding discussions um, of you know, very opinionated colleagues um, and clients um, who don't often initially see eye to eye on a particular issue. But through my overseeing meetings and, and managing teams, I'm often able to um, bring people to consensus points. And I think I've been able to, to do the same in our work on the board, um, most of us are, are oriented towards the same goals, and that is identifying uh, areas for improvement in order to prevent domestic violence homicides. But we have a number of professionals coming from various backgrounds, and as you would expect, our discussion is often lively. Sometimes there are differences of opinion. And I think in my, my role as co-chair of the board, um, in which I oversee the board, run the board along with Ms. Lee and run our meetings allows me to find ways to kind of bring consensus and keep discussions going and make sure that we don't veer off on tracks that are unproductive to the work that we're all um, gathered to do. And so I think those are just some of the ways that my experience um, has, has helped on the board. Thank you very much. And as the co-chairs uh, of us today, are there any other kind of infrastructure challenges or uh, room for growth that either of you have identified that you'd like to focus on in the year ahead to make the work of the board even more impactful? Well, as you as you would expect, COVID certainly presented some challenges for the administration of the board. Prior to the pandemic, we would meet monthly in in person um, in a large boardroom and. Um, in spaces that allowed for breaking off to have small group discussion, but be together and come back together. And I think that togetherness naturally promoted um, the work that we were gathered to do. The pandemic necessitated that we adopt a virtual format for, for our meetings, for our record sharing, all of that. Um, and I have been quite impressed by our coordinators' um, ease with transitioning into that way of running meetings. 
I, I do think that we would enjoy coming back together in person in the near term. Many of us have gotten used to doing business in a virtual format, but there are obvious efficiencies and benefits to doing this work and having this discussion in person. And so I think Layla and I and um, Ms. Bocamp will continue the discussions that we're having now about how to potentially reintroduce some of our work in person, including um, planning a, a board retreat that we've, we've started to think through. And um, so I, I think some of the challenges, again, that, that we've experienced have just been in adopting um, the virtual format to, to our gatherings and convenings. But I would not say that it's, that it's actually hindered our work in a way that you know, is notable. Thank you. Ms. Lee, do you have anything to add to that? Um, I think all I would add to that is to just, again, um, really compliment the incredible work that our coordinator does to keep us um, on track, to keep work moving in between meetings. She's really been an incredible asset to us. So um, I think we've all been working really well together. In terms of, um, you know, effectiveness of the board or, or improving infrastructure, I mean, I think we've said it in our testimony, we've been trying to work together and think through, you know, in this virtual format, as long as we're doing this, you know, how are we promoting participation and engagement and um, creating an environment where everybody feels welcome to share. And I do agree that uh, Ms. Chavis's skills towards um, diplomacy and encourage everybody to um, to arrive at consensus have been really helpful. So um, yeah, and in terms of doing our work, I think we've we're already taking steps to make sure that everybody's active and engaged and encouraging people to participate in meetings and um, all come together to give the best possible recommendations. Thank you very much. Ms. Sims, how do you think the district and district partners can work more effectively to intervene in cases of domestic violence before fatality results um, in thinking about the experiences of the cases that you've reviewed? Thank you. Um, I think it starts by believing the survivors and listening to their needs. Um, also removing the barriers um, from uh, from the move, removing the barriers um, that prevent survivors from accessing really needed services. Um, and I think that is a collaborative effort. And I think it takes education as well. Um, and I think it takes empathy and compassion. Um, and I think at the end of the day, realizing that these are human beings and they're vulnerable. Um, and that as a community, we should come together to support each other um, and figure out uh, how to assist. Thank you. And what are some of those key barriers that you've seen in getting service delivered most effectively? Yes, um, I would say availability. I know that sometimes a lot of the service organizations in the district um, don't have the amount of people needed to um, assist and to be there for these survivors, um, whether that's uh, trouble calling them or trouble um, the organizations not being open or not readily available. Um, I know in like the therapeutic space, there are a lot of wait lists for organizations. Um, a lot of survivors do not have access to mental health services in the immediate aftermath of their violent incidents. Right? So there is um, kind of a general lack of support sometimes uh, that survivors don't have in reaching other people who can disrupt and intervene before it can get to that point. So I just think that um, the availability um, and the knowledge of what's available in the city um, to be greatly approved upon. Thank you very much. And Ms. Lee, do you have other thoughts on how the district government and its agencies can be better partners in the work that you all are doing and seeing? Um, you know, I, th I think, and thank you for the question, I think something that we work on on the board you know, when we're making recommendations is just trying to figure out how we can improve um, communication among agencies, whether that's between 
um, you know, MPD and and uh, CFSA, for example, or between the courts and um, and the community. You know, we're always looking for ways that we can strengthen the systems that exist um, in order to provide more continuity of care for survivors. So, for example, you know, when we uh, when I had mentioned, although I of course can't talk about any of the cases um, in detail due to confidentiality, but when I mentioned in my testimony that I'm interested in strengthening supports for child survivors of domestic violence. You know, uh, one of the things that I mean there is in many of the cases we review, there is um, a child or children involved who has lost their primary caretaker. And, you know, the responses that we have as a community to that child, both immediately after the fatality, you know, what does MPD do? You know, like, what is the protocol? You know, how soon do they connect them with CFSA if that's warranted? You know, what does CFSA do? You know, in the immediate aftermath. And then throughout that child's life, this is not somebody who's going to take like 12 therapy sessions and then be done, right? They've, they've experienced a lifelong trauma that's going to affect how they grow up and how they form romantic relationships. So then what are we doing for that, that young person, you know, both in their schooling and their therapeutic support services, um, Ms. Sims identified, you know, the sometimes the lack of availability of therapeutic services, both distributed evenly throughout the district and, you know, service providers that take Medicaid and that are easy to get to. So, you know, uh, strengthening those systems, whether it be through funding or um, programs that encourage professionals to pursue that line of work, you know, if that's coming from OBSJG or another, another entity. Um, I think that's, I think that would be very important and go a long way to support the work of the board and the recommendations we're making or that we've made in the past. Um, and then I think the final piece of that with child survivors is just the accountability. You know, like if we're saying that, you know, survivors have these certain rights and should be able to access certain services, you know, throughout uh, and across agencies, who is checking up on that? You know, so I think we're trying to look for those gaps. That's part of the charge of the board to look for those systemic gaps to make recommendations. But just having um, the support of the council, the government, you know, and the agencies that we're making recommendations to to really work together on this issue, because I do believe, you know, I wouldn't be on this board. I wouldn't be looking at, you know, the child survivors of fatalities. I wouldn't be interested in, in youth and providing prevention programming around healthy relationships. I didn't really think that we could break cycles and do better generation to generation. So um, I hope that I hope that addresses the question. Definitely. No, that's very helpful. Good examples. Thank you for that. I like to believe that too. Um, Ms. Chavez, based on your pro bono work experience obtaining protective orders for survivors of domestic violence, how do you think our legal system can better protect clients seeking protective, seeking protection, and how can we better educate the public about how to uh, receive a protective order? So I, I think your question actually captures the spirit of the answer that I'll provide um, very well. Um, I, I cannot speak about the particulars of, of any of the matters that I've handled on behalf of indig individual clients, but obviously through my work, um, and representation of individuals and appearances in court and handling of litigation it had um, a pretty significant exposure to the uh, domestic um, branch and DC Superior Court and the related um, service partners that often are involved in uh, the resolution of temporary protective order matters and, and, and permanent protective order matters. And I think that one of the biggest areas of improvement and one of the kind of key themes um, that I've, I've noticed in the cases that I've handled is uh, the need for greater communication of the services and of the process um, that, that underlies seeking a protective order in the District of Columbia. Yeah. Uh, this website is a comprehensive um, place of information. Um, but many individuals who are seeking protective orders do not have um, the time to peruse 
a detailed website and sift through records and click through links and, and pull forms and piece together information that, that might enable them to pursue a protective order. And kind of as a fundamental matter, I think most, most people that are seeking um, protection in court are not represented by counsel, um, at least in the first instance. And so they're navigating this process on their own. Um, and so I think thinking through better ways of communicating the availability of relief through court and supportive services that can assist individuals who are not represented by counsel um, should be something that we all continue to think through. Um, you know, community signage and, and flyers and leaving information in places that are frequented by um, community members, whether they be rec centers or, um, you know, businesses and, and individual neighborhoods um, partnering with the faith community to distribute information related to the process that, that one might need to pursue in order to seek protective orders. I think thinking through those, those communication channels and those avenues outside of um, the court's own, own website is something that, that we've had some discussion about on the board and should really um, continue to kind of emphasize and focus on in our work. I think obviously the more information that is accessible to one who may need it, uh, the more likely that they'll be able to take action that would amount to safety in their lives and the safety of their family. Um, and so that, that's probably what I would remark as kind of the key area of improvement, thinking through creative ways to disseminate information about the court process and the service partners um, that, that might be involved in the process of seeking a protective order. Okay, thank you very much. And we'll certainly play our part there in sharing that information and thinking through that. So for any of you who may have thoughts on this question, it's my understanding that the review board focuses its in-depth reviews and recommendations on intimate partner domestic violence homicides um, because they tend to follow similar patterns. There were more non-intimate partner homicides in the district in 2021 than intimate partner homicides. Do any of you think there is an additional need to conduct in-depth reviews and develop recommendations to address these types of domestic violent homicides as well? Given the volume, of, I'm, I'm happy to begin. Um, given the volume of of those incidents, there certainly is a need to study the circumstances of them. Um, as you noted, the work of our board, um, our review of cases in order to develop recommendations that are reasonably framed such, such that the, the agency that those recommendations are directed to can, can implement them, implement them quickly. Um, those recommendations really um, derived from kind of the thematic uh, similarities that, that we find in the intimate partner cases that we're studying. I would be interested um, in, in, and I've not served, I've not surveyed the, the non-intimate partner cases that, that you're referring to. I'd be interested in, you know, whether themes as easily can be extracted such that the recommendations that would flow from that case review um, could be, you know, as efficient and, um, you know, directed as the recommendations that that we make. Um, and so that's just maybe one flag that I would share, but certainly um, given the rise in those cases and the volume in those cases, um, I think they're the circumstances of merits review um, by someone. Thank you. Anyone else have thoughts on this? Yeah, I would say I didn't. I don't think I had realized um, the that the frequency was that that high. Um, but I would I would agree with Ms. Chavis that the board has focused on intimate partner for as long as I can. I think we maybe have reviewed a case or two that wasn't um, clear cut intimate partner violence, but. Um, you know, we've examined those systems and have been trying to, I think our recommendations tend to build on what we've been doing and try to like grow incrementally on a, on a path. Um, so to that, I would say, you know, to the extent that we can identify 
as Ms. Chava said, perhaps it would be good for, if not this board, another another dedicated board to be looking more broadly at like family-based violence. So we're trying to identify particular patterns that repeat in this, this type of violence. Not to say that someone who has experienced intimate partner violence, um, either in their own personal relationship or you know, as a child witness, couldn't that couldn't um, um, spill over into other relationships. And actually we, we sometimes see that it does, right? Even in our case reviews, we get information about that. Um, but I think we we do want to make sure that our I believe that the work on this board is um, focused enough so that it can be impactful in in the organizations and the target agencies that we're making recommendations to. Um, and I, and I, I think in perhaps my completely biased opinion that we've been pretty effective at doing that so far. Ms. Sims, do you have any other thoughts to add on the review of non-intimate partner domestic homicides? Um, my only thought is uh, that um, any type of fatality causes ripple effects in the community, in the family, um, and that type of trauma has long-lasting consequences and long-term effects. So I think about uh, the transgenerational violence and how environmental factors intersect to maintain a sphere of violence. So even if it is a, a non-intimate partner violent situation, it can create um, almost a foundation uh, for those individuals involved so that it can grow into that in that next generation. So I think it's really important to look at those factors, um, but I'm not sure if we have the capacity on the board to um, look at all of it, so. Okay, thank you. Um, Ms. Lee, based on your experience working with young people who have experienced dating violence, sexual assault, or stalking, how do you think the district can better reach young people before they experience this type of abuse? Thank you for that question. Um, you know, the board had made a prior recommendation, which I, um, which, uh, around and have made some related recommendations around uh, healthy relationship programming and prevention education programming. And um, I believe through the um, Safe and Supportive Schools Act um, passed, what, two years ago? Correct me if I'm wrong, um, Ms. Chavis. So I know the district schools have started to implement these programs. Um, so perhaps just making sure that both there is uh, prevention education programming in schools and that the schools have the support and funding and professional resources available to provide that. Um, and both training for their staff and uh, you know, programming for like peer-to-peer -peer education programs. Because I think it's, it is important for the staff to be trained and educated, but from what I've also seen working with youth, it's you know, coming from peers, like having a, a, a social expectation, like your peer group believing that you should have healthy relationships and saying like, you know, that isn't right if somebody's treating you in a certain type of way, um, that's that's more powerful. So um, I, I think allowing for the prevention education programming and making sure that uh, young people have support both in their schools, you know, for their school counseling if they've experienced partner violence, that they have safe adults that they can talk to. Um, and ideally that they also have resources outside of school hours that would be accessible to them so that they can maintain their, um, their sense of privacy and control over their lives because those are both things that are very important for youth. Thank you very much. And in thinking about how to make sure people can avail themselves of these services. Ms. Sims, based on your experience as a licensed graduate professional counselor, what barriers have you seen most preventing survivors from accessing mental health support? I would say the financial aspect, um, it costs a pretty penny um, and a lot of mental health professionals um, and to not take insurance. And if they do take insurance, 
right? There has to be um, a mental health diagnosis associated with that, um, that's, that service, right? And I know that sometimes people don't necessarily need to be diagnosed with a mental health illness. They just need to work through the trauma that they've experienced. So um, there's distrust of mental health professionals as well. Um, everyone may not be as well-versed in trauma-informed services. Uh, they may um, re-trigger and re-traumatize their survivor if they don't have that necessary expertise, if they don't have that training in how to deal with survivors. Um, also, there are programs to help in payment, like the Crime Victims Compensation Program, right? But sometimes that payment comes late. And uh, a lot of mental health professionals don't accept it sometimes because of that. So there are just uh, those systemic barriers that um, may discourage survivors from accessing those type of support. Um, and then the availability uh, it is so many of the organizations in the city have wait lists, you know, that can extend from like six to nine months. Mm -hmm. And the capacity is just really limited a lot of the time for survivors. So. Thank you. It's very helpful. Um, to any of you, are there other things the district can do to better support residents who've lost a family member to domestic violence? Yeah, I think, uh, Chairperson Pinto, thank you for the question. I think it builds on it, what we've been saying, you know, just a growing capacity around mental health services, supportive services you know, uh, grief counseling organizations that have expertise in grief counseling, like the WEN Center often have a very long wait list, um, unfortunately, right? So um, to the extent that we can build capacity, whether that's encouraging, you know, existing um, therapists to practice here, to provide funding for them to, or whether, you know, whether that's through, um, grant programs to provide supportive services so that, you know, the people that are trying to access those services don't have to worry about the costs. Um, I think that that would be really huge. I would, I would agree with all of that and only also add that, as I noted earlier, for, I think for, for believers and even potentially for non-believers, um, that services and support offered by the faith community can be um, particularly helpful. Um, churches and faith centers often have resources to develop and provide programming and services that um, some of our more limited traditional service partners um, cannot provide at least immediately due to the wait list uh, that, that we've touched on. And so I would encourage um, the district to consider ways to better partner with the faith community in this area. I know that the city has uh, an interfaith network or coalition, I'm probably not calling it by its, its proper name, um, but there may be ways to um, turn to that uh, initiative and to that coalition to develop some of the services that, that would be required and helpful for families and for victims and loved ones. Uh, of, of victims. I would also say um, there are some barriers for families to receive services due to maybe not having strong internet connections for signing on to therapy over the virtual space mm -hmm. or even getting to in-person services. So I do provide in-person services when requested. And then um, the grant that covers my program, the FISPA grant, also um, will contribute money to for like Uber services for clients who need to get to services. So um, it can also be like that technological um, barrier for those families, especially young children, um, to try to access the services for mental health support. Okay, that is very helpful. Thank you all. Is there anything else uh, that we haven't talked about today that anybody wants to add to the record? Any final thoughts? Chairperson, as I, as I know you, and I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said, I think you were starting to speak, but as, as I know you're, um, as I know you know, uh, the board creates an annual report of our work 
um, and uh, includes description of our recommendations and kind of our, our you know, major themes um, derived from cases that we've uh, considered and reviewed each year. And that is really, and then, and then there are uh, kind of multi-year reports that we prepare as well. Um, but those materials are, you know, incredibly fruitful and reflective of the work that the board is doing. And certainly should uh, you, and this committee and the council um, in general have recommendations to us for how we might better operate in particular um, policies that from your perspectives as representatives and legislators, you think we should be focusing on and might not be, um, that that document is helpful in terms of framing that feedback and we'd be very happy to receive it. Yeah, I would add to that, you know, if there's any feedback on the report or to the extent that um, it helps uh, the committee identify patterns or that, you know, I'm sure that you, things come to your attention and across your desk that perhaps wouldn't come up in our in our reviews or other patterns that might contribute to the work that we're seeing. Um, you know, maintaining that open line of communication would be fantastic. And I would just add to, to you, Chairperson Pinto, and to the members of the committee, thank you for making this board's work a priority. You said in the beginning that, you know, this was the first um, that you were doing. So I, I really appreciate that. That's very encouraging to, to me. Thank you. Well, that concludes my questions for you all. And thank you so much um, for these nominees and for your service to this extremely important, difficult work. And you have a partner in us and we look forward to trying to reduce these incidents throughout the year. Uh, there being no further business before the committee, we are adjourned. The time is now 1043 AM. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.